Welcome back everyone. This is a Silicon Angle special segment here live at HP Discover for exclusive coverage of HP Discover live in Barcelona, Spain. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with my co-host Dave Vellante, co-founder of Wikibon.org, and also Mark Hopkins of Silicon Angle, Silicon Angle TV, the Q, master of all things behind the curtain, Silicon Angle, uh, founding editor of uh, Silicon Angle with me going back 2009. Um, special segment, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, what's going on in the news, and hot technology trends. As you know, SiliconANGLE is a reference point for tech innovation, wikibon.org, free research. We've been covering the enterprise, big data, cloud, mobile, and social like a blanket, and we're going to go down and discuss some of the hottest trends. And uh, if you've been following theCUBE, you know that Dave Vellante and I always have been debating Bitcoin. Um, I'm for, Dave was against. Uh, Bitcoin and uh, Dave's starting to come around, so. It's not that I'm against we, it. We, <laughs> I'm always asking. So Bitcoin. Hold on, let me finish, yeah. please, let me finish. <laughs> so we are going to have a place, he wants to learn more, he's open to learning, as Dave is, yeah. always open to learning. Uh, we're going to have a session on Bitcoin. Well, but for those of you who watch Silicon Angle, you've seen a lot of Bitcoin coverage, and maybe wondering, like I had, <laughs> why the hell is Silicon Angle covering Bitcoin so much, right? That was sort of my question to you. Oh, okay. And what was your response? It's Bitcoin's very relevant, it's an emerging technology, and my response was specifically, SiliconANGLE doesn't break news, we break markets. And Bitcoin is a market we've been looking at for a very long time. In fact, we paid developers in Bitcoin uh, going back a couple years ago, and Mark Hopkins and, and the team at SiliconANGLE that no one sees is, is scouring for these new markets. Bitcoin is one of them. So now, just to clarify, we had a similar conversation about this thing called Hadoop back <laughs> several years ago. <laughs> it does the Duke yeah. matter, right? And we, so. we had the same conversation about software defined before it was called software defined. David Floyer called it IO centric infrastructure. So, Silicon Angle and Wikibon have been breaking markets for the past four years, and we are the number one media organization that is ahead of the curve on all new relevant technologies. And the key word is relevant. So, <laughs> what I want to do so here. So, is Bitcoin relevant? That's so, the, so, Bitcoin is very relevant. Uh, new cryptocurrencies is a trend, and you know, to me, my vision has always been you know, smells like a big mega trend, and we look at it, it has emerged because of. Uh, you know, so obviously the Silk Road drug outfit got busted, busted, was dealing in Bitcoin. You know, you start to see the underbelly really is foster some of these new technologies. You know, porn is always discussed as well. Um, so we brought Mark Hopkins on here in theCUBE. Uh, usually he's behind the, 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 uh, the curtain, as like I said. Mark has uh, been, been a Bitcoin follower, has Bitcoin, um, trades Bitcoin, runs and co curates the Dr. Bitcoin column. So Mark, give us a quick tutorial. Um, you know, and, and Dave's got a great point. You know, we want to know what this emerging technology is. So let's break it down, 101 Bitcoin, for the folks out there, what is Bitcoin? way to put it, because it, Bitcoin is, uh, is many things to many people. It's a, it's a commodity, uh, uh, to, depending on how you treat it. It could be a currency. You can treat it simply as a way of processing payments internationally or, or locally, if you so <coughs> desire. Um, the, basically, what makes it unique from something like PayPal or something like uh, you know, uh, Visa or MasterCard is that uh, Bitcoin will allow you to uh, uh, process this stuff without paying uh, you know, a fee or, or being answerable to a, a central organization. You know, you, you, you pay with PayPal, you're paying your, your, your four Like a central six, bank. Yeah, there's a four to six percent fee that goes to PayPal and there's a whole corporation that supports that and there's someone at the head of that. Um, uh, similarly, with the, the US dollar in general, there is a Federal Reserve Bank that, you know, sets policy and interest rates for that denomination. So it's a democratized it's totally currency. Demo it's, it's a headless corporation. Controlled by the market. Yeah. Period. By the market and, uh, and by the algorithm, right. So what do you mean by the algorithm? What algorithm? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it kind of in general terms because we can go down the rabbit hole on all the, the technical stuff. But basically, uh, there's, there's something that's referred to as the blockchain. And, and the blockchain is a, uh, a record of every transaction that's ever occurred in Bitcoin. And that blockchain is hashed by Bitcoin, they call them Bitcoin miners, but they're basically like uh, 
computerized accounting software. And as uh, a block of the chain is successfully hashed, successfully verified as you know, you know, no fraud attempts, no uh, double spends, that sort of thing, an award is given to those accountants, basically like pay, and that's how new uh, Bitcoin is minted in the system. So that award is a virtual coin. A virtual coin, right. That has value. Right, it has what? value and can't be duplicated. And, and what's the value of bit, a Bitcoin today? Uh, so the spot price right now on uh, one of the most common markets uh, is $960 per coin. Where, where, <laughs> well, okay. Sounds like a lot for a coin. Yeah. Well, now, where did the market start? And when, when, when did it start? Uh, so it's it's about three years old. Three so years old, and it, and it started at what level? Uh, I mean, like you know, less than pennies per coin. So, really? So, so you're talking pennies per coin? Yeah. And now it's worth nine hundred. So <laughs> the first the first major first recorded uh, like uh, what it was for uh, Bitcoin transaction was uh, someone paid for a pizza twenty thousand bitcoins. Okay. Yeah, so <laughs> different value obviously back then. Okay, and, and, and so obviously if, if you invested a little bit of money in Bitcoin back then three years ago, you'd be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, or more. There, there are bit, the term is for that is bit millionaire. There are bit million, millionaires yeah. out there. Okay, and, and so what's driving uh, the price up? Uh, supply and demand? Supply and demand. Right now, uh, China has, re as of about six to eight weeks ago, has just, just exploded their interest in, uh, in Bitcoin, and uh, the, the price has been driven up by that. So maybe the Bitcoin over the Yuan for the we, next Dave, we missed, the, we missed the Bitcoin gold rush. <laughs> the Bitcoin bubble? <laughs> is it a bubble? Well, let's talk about Bitcoin for a second on, on, on two things. Right? One is fraud, bubble, the downside, but let's get in the front end. Sure. Why is Bitcoin relevant? So to me, uh, this is the conversation we want, we'll start with. Um, to me, it's always about the currencies, online, behavior is shifting where a new generation has mobile devices, Dave, so there's, you're seeing new payment methods. I remember when PayPal launched, people laughed at PayPal. No one will ever, ever pay on the web. That was talked about. So PayPal was like, what are you, crazy? I'm going to put my bank information on the wire? Never, it's never going to happen. Okay, there it is, PayPal. So same with Bitcoin. There's still the FUD around alternative currencies. It's still small relative to the overall global currency market, but it does have momentum, it has legs. There are actual transactions being done. And the question is, can Bitcoin be an alternative currency for a new culture of online users? Mark, we'll start with you. Well, I mean, I think so. I think you, 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 you have to say yes to that because if you look at the ranking of, uh, of, of bit payment processes that are out there, uh, you, the Bitcoin has already passed up PayPal in terms of facilitating online transactions. It's, it's, in terms know, of what metric? In terms of uh, daily transaction volume. So uh, daily transaction volume, it's PayPal and Bitcoin are vying neck and neck for actual purchases. For goods really? and services. Yeah. For so, goods and services. So what kinds of things are Bitcoins being you know, used to, to buy? Uh, Tesla just started accepting Bitcoin last week. Uh, the Long Beach uh, Lamborghini dealership uh, Sam Pack Ford, these are like noteworthy car dealerships. Uh, Trying to attract those Bitcoin millionaires. Right, right. Uh, <laughs> there's been several houses bought and sold. There's, uh, it's very popular in, just on the street. There's like a lot of coffee shops, uh, a couple of bars in Dallas I know uh, that do it. Very in Venezuela, it's actually common. But for they're person willing to, person. to be paid in Bitcoin, so they're betting that the, the bit, value of Bitcoin will increase. Right, right, yeah. I mean, so I mean, and it makes sense. Um, and there's a lot of shady yeah. transactions oh, yeah, going course, on. Oh yeah, of course, of course. Well, well you say of course, like what? Like, well, what? Silk Road, it was in the news, right? So the, this guy, uh, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts was his online name, uh, but uh, he, he was arrested recently and uh, because he was running this online marketplace, it was like an eBay for drugs and guns and all kinds of illicit activity. Drugs, guns, porn. Right, okay. they're running it over the Tor network. But I mean, that was also, uh, you know, kind of it being taken down was also kind of a watershed moment for Bitcoin itself. And people go, okay, now we don't have this albatross, you know, hanging around. We can talk about Bitcoin in legitimate terms. Because in all actuality, and this came up in the, the, the Bitcoin Senate hearings last week, uh, the, one of the directors from FinCEN actually said, United States dollar is still the most efficient way to launder money. Still the most, still the most commonly used criminal transaction method. So uh, let's okay. Let's get past that. So, so take us through. Take said. us through how someone buys a Tesla, and, how, and if I'm a Tesla business, right? How do I determine the value of the Bitcoin? Do I just say, okay, a Tesla costs, let's just say, for round numbers, 100 grand? 
So yeah, so if, if you're any business or any person that's selling goods and services, you really don't want to go with what the spot price is because, I mean, while we've sat here, it's, it's fluctuated, uh, I don't know, 2% in value, right? So most uh, pay, uh, payment processing shopping cart systems based on Bitcoin will use like a 24 hour or 48 hour moving average uh, and basic on, on instead of using a spot price. And that, unless there's a, uh, a hype cycle going on, rel stays relatively stable. It's not going to fluctuate more than, you know, uh, maybe 2% over the course of a week a or two. But there's a limited supply of Bitcoin out of there, Of course, right? yeah, there will always be a limited oh, supply. But the algorithm determines uh, whether or not a coin is minted, yeah. virtually. But so, can there be an infinite number of coins minted? Isn't that going to just tank the price? No, no, so that's, that's the way the algorithm is designed. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoins. 21 million? Yeah. So that's a cap, and how many are out there today? Uh, out, roughly half, roughly half. Okay. But as time goes on, less and less get minted over the same periods of, of uh, hashing times. So if that's true and Bitcoin is a viable currency, then the, the value almost certainly will increase, won't it? Absolutely, it's, and that's a feature, not a bug. It's a sorry? It's it, a feature, not a bug, of, of the system as part of the design. It was designed to be a deflationary currency. How could that algorithm be changed if the community decides to change it? Or who right. is the community? The community, well, I mean, there's, there's developers, obviously. Uh, that they can write the code. Any, anybody that's developing the code for this can say, okay, this is going to be the next change, but it's up to the, the collective of thousands and thousands of Bitcoin miners to accept that change. Like they can, the developers can say, okay, we're doing this now, and the, and the miners can say, you know, that's not in our best interest. Bitcoin we're not miners, what's a Bitcoin miner? So the, those are the people I was talking about that hash the blockchain. Okay. So they, they own pieces of equipment that are CPUs and GPUs that are in ASICs that are specifically devoted to verifying transactions. Okay, so they have to weigh in. Yeah, how many weigh, they weigh how, in with How many feet. miners are there? Oh, it, millions at least. So, and it's dominated by larger players, uh, but uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many people involved in it. I mean, you can, you can buy into this ecosystem and start mining for you know, $70, or you can buy $50,000 worth of equipment. So there's people out there, you mentioned Tesla, willing, or Tesla dealers willing to get paid in Bitcoin. Would you personally be willing to get paid in Bitcoin? Yes. Yeah, actually I would. I, it's, it's, I think it's, a, at least at this stage in the game, it's, it's very, uh, it, to hold your big, even if you're spending daily, you know, I, I use my Bitcoin at Target to buy groceries, right? But the part that I don't use goes up in value. So um, it, if I'm holding even just a, you know, kind of a, a personal reserve or my savings in Bitcoin, uh, as an individual that does me you know, it's better than holding it in dollars because dollars go down in value over time and so, Bitcoin goes up. So you up. could have bought, you know, back three years ago, 500 Bitcoin for what, 15 cents, 25 cents, a quarter, a you know, dollar, yeah. whatever it is, it'd be worth close to half a million dollars today. That's right. So, uh, so John, you know, this is okay. I, I, I grant you there's an interesting trend uh, and alternative currencies uh, have been talked about for quite some time. Um, what, well, for, two questions. One, would you be willing to get paid in, in Bitcoin? And, and what, my second is, what other big trends do you see occurring in the tech world? Well, I mean, first of all, on the Bitcoin, um, yes, I'd consider getting paid in Bitcoin because endorsing the trend, I'm an early adopter, I would probably take the chance. But I always worry, I, I want to put my, myself on the use case because what I'm afraid of is the, what is the value dropping? The fluctuations concern me, right? So to me, the stability of, the, of Bitcoin is a relative factor, right? So I can't have you know, something be worth $100,000, say a Tesla, uh, or services, and then all of a sudden I get paid 100,000, and and that's not worth anything. It's worth about 5,000, yeah, so, 10,000. So, and so, how hard is it to cash out? I mean, is it? So there, there exists uh, a lot of uh, markets uh, that you can cash, I mean, look, this is the list of markets here, it's like, I don't know, 85, 100 of them. So those are all kind of governed by the same kind of Places uh, where you economics. can sell your Bitcoin. Yeah, and, and so. You're paid in paid in, in dollars or euros or, or, or anything that you want. Whatever currency. Yeah, whatever your preference is. Some of them are harder to use than others. Uh, some of them, are, most of them are geared towards large traders. So that, uh, but the easiest way for an individual to get in and out of that is to use something like local Bitcoin and find someone like me that is active in the community in a city near you. And you can go meet them at a coffee shop and say, oh, here's 50 bucks, give me $50 worth of Bitcoin. All right, John, so, so where do you put this relative to some of the other trends that you're seeing? What else do you see going on out there? Well, the thing about Bitcoin that gets my attention is it's so disruptive, and it's the fact that the user experience of what's happening online relative to massive online gaming, 
uh, massive online learning, MOOCs as they call them. You're seeing essentially what you, <laughs> I call the Xbox or PlayStation model of, you know, massively online environments are the future collaboration environments. So that's kind of one vision I see. When you see that kind of environment where you're in always connected devices and people are threaded together, I think a new fabric of culture and Robert Youngjohns was talking about this around big data autonomy, you're going to see new expectations by users, and one of them will be some sort of online currency model like Bitcoin. So to me, Bitcoin is very, very relevant because like PayPal was for the web, a natural extension of buying e-commerce goods online, I think a whole new social fabric will be constructed around what's going on around consumers, real time, analytics, big data will create new applications, new real time benefits, and when you're doing anything in real time that involves real time collaboration, you've got to have e-commerce components. So to me, Dave, the e-commerce equation will be disrupted and Bitcoin is rising above and has the momentum of all other cryptocurrencies, and so to me, I would bet on Bitcoin. I'm bullish on Bitcoin, and again, you see some of the big secondary market type people coming in supporting it. You see venture funds coming in support Bitcoin. So I think some stability is around the corner. That is the ultimate question around Bitcoin. So I like to see these clearing houses come in. I like to see market makers come in. And what you're seeing right now is that's the macro dynamics. Now the microeconomic side of it is going to be interesting. Uh, you know, I could put stuff on the internet app down in Phoenix and start doing some mining on the crypto. I still think there's a, the black box mining issue is a huge thing for Bitcoin. So, so on the business side, I see good momentum on Bitcoin. On the technical side, on the crypto mining, I still think there's got to be some backdoors. I am just skeptical that the, you know, the alpha geeks have some sort of backdoor to the, to the quote, gold mine for Bitcoin. <laughs> so again, that's just my fear. Yeah. But overall, yeah, you're saying if, if, if trading the commodity is not the only way to make money, then that's a problem. Well, right? it's certainly a bubble. If you look at the fluctuations, certainly a bubble, but you know, certainly the stability factor, if that continues, and the mom while the momentum, and overlaying on the user experience of this new online culture that's developing, but, you, that's, it's a perfect storm of innovation and disruption. I think it's a, it could be a serious winner. It, I mean, it, there's definitely more stability now than there was before, uh, but the, you can't deny that there's, there's been wild fluctuations. But like, you look at this time last year, there was fluctuations in, an, in excess of 75% of whatever the spot price was. Little, little mini bubbles and bursts. And now uh, we just had a mini bubble burst cycle. It was only a 35% fluctuation, and that was with China involved, right? Massive influx of capital, uh, so and massive influx of, of computing power too, uh, which I was just pulling up. This is a recent headline. Uh, the Bitcoin mining network is now 256 times more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers put together. Yeah, <laughs> all I mean, of them. Well, so, I mean, there is stability there. There's a lot of stability. Well, there's also, a, there's there's also a derivative and, innovation effect. I mean, if you look right. at all the key innovations around the computer industry, it's always fund, government funding. So, you know, on the, there's a pony in there somewhere for new innovation, as I always yeah. say. Um, so I that, don't know if I'd call it stability. I call it the potential for stability. I right? definitely I mean, don't think it's stability. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's stability on the horizon. You're seeing market forces drive stability. If goods and services are being transacted as the level Mark was talking about, Dave, then in, you know, no doubt stability has to be there. Otherwise, it all comes crashing down. So you have the naysayers saying doom and gloom, crash and burn, and then the will optimists. We, will retail stores be taking Bitcoin as currency I, I, in the next so, five years? Yes, uh, absolutely. Am Amazon okay. has talked I, about it, uh, Target. I mean, some of the bigger ones are a little bit more reticent. I mean, Bank of America has been talking about uh, you know, big major endorsements this week, uh, Merrill Lynch. So within a decade, you would see either Bitcoin or some alternative currency a, a cryptocurrency is pretty widespread. Uh, it, yeah, I, I would say so. That's yeah. a, you feel like that's a very high probability. Yeah, it's and you would agree with that, John. Yeah, I think it's a very high probability that all people will be taking Bitcoin with the caveat of some of the stability things, but you're already seeing the signs of, there's a startup in California that's doing a Kickstarter called Coin. Um, they have all this new payment. All the, you're going to see, I believe, an application market on top of it. The financial markets are yes. coming in on a secondary market basis. You're seeing market makers, you're seeing Clearinghouse, and if you go to the developer community, if there's an abstraction layer of apps, for e-commerce and for other transactions that are on, in this new culture of massively online gaming, porn, drug dealing, as you see, and then the current market is, is porn and drug dealing. That's a, a, that's a proof positive, I got to say. If you look at all the early adopters, all the innovations tested in those really high volume, highly transactional cash markets. So who wins, who loses? So the consumer wins, yeah. presumably. Who loses, who gets disrupted? Well, I mean, uh, banks, it's, it's, uh, it, banks have a potential to lose, just like uh, newspapers had a potential to lose at the advent of blogging and social media. Because and these they're types. currently marking. Right, they, they, the is it totally different? Is it disruptive to their current model? 
uh, payment processors. It's disruptive to their current model. Uh, eBay stands to lose if they don't adapt. With PayPal. Yeah, so I'd love to get Meg Whitman's perspective on this. She was uh, executive at eBay. She was flouting her eBay uh, credentials on their keynote. I wonder what she thinks of cryptocurrencies. Obviously, being with the geeks at HP, they have, certainly have the horsepower to do the, do the mining. Yeah. Um, but, so yeah, so Dave, that, I'm, I'm good on Bitcoin. Other news uh, around the web, um, you know, we're looking at SiliconANGLE right now. Um, obviously, still the stories on, around the NSA. You're still seeing uh, the social media world going crazy with the recent tsunami of investments. You saw Twitter go public. That's still, we got a backlash of massive social, social startups now coming out of the woodwork. You're seeing huge startups around networking. I think SDN is enabling networks. Sequoia just announced the 33, or not announced, was broken. They had a $33 million investment made in a stealth uh, networking startup. Uh, you're seeing, um, you know, Facebook warring with Twitter and LinkedIn. I think you're going to see a complete reconstruction of the social media business. Um, obviously, we launched CrowdChat this week. What about uh, the Twitter IPO? What about it? What, what, what's your take <laughs> on it? I mean, I'm personally very pleased with the... Well, I think they went the by the book. Facebook hacked the IPO process and everyone made a lot of money. Wall Street kind of got there, kind of got taken on the uh, Facebook IPO. But again, the goal of an IPO is liquidity. Facebook definitely blew away Twitter on the liquidity front. Twitter was much more conservative, mainly because the Twitter revenue model is not up and running yet. So if you look at Facebook, they were cleared the runway on one massive numbers, massive active numbers. Twitter's still unknown, and the way Twitter filed their S1 day, they filed it under the, the uh, $1 billion revenue number, so they had some confidentiality on the IPO. So you saw some, some, some stuff was kind of hidden under the covers. You really had to dig into the IPO S1 to really figure out that there wasn't a lot of revenue in there, and still an open book on the revenue model. Me, I'm personally, I'm bullish on Twitter. I think it's going to be an absolute continue to grow stock. So I'm a buy on I, Twitter. I, I want to give some plug to you, because we were at Oracle Open World at the end of uh, 2012. I don't know if you remember this, like October, November 2012, and Facebook stock was taking a big hit because the IPO was kind of, you know, was, was, was sort of screwing the consumers, like you said, a great liquidity event for the, for the owners. And you said, you called it then a buying opportunity. Yeah. You know, a lot I of mean, people disagreed with that. I, I was actually bullish on Facebook as well, so I kind of agreed with you on that one. You look at where Facebook is today, I mean at the time the stock was in, you know, single digits, it's up over 50 now. Yeah, and so that was what, 20 something when that That happened? was 2012. No, 20 dollar stock price. When they, when I said buy, or what were you talking about? When no, I was, it was under that. Yeah, the IPO came out at 20 something and then now it's at 50. It went up and down. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was below 20, just yeah, below 20. Once they announced their, where their revenues are, now that they're actually putting a lot of ads in the feed, they can crank up so the revenue. So Facebook, a lot of upside, you think? Yeah, Facebook is the web, right? I mean, Facebook yeah. has a single identity, they're winning that. However, however, there's a big Cold War going on in the tech business, and this is to take note of. What do you mean? So, the Cold War going on in the consumer tech business is Facebook, billion users, LinkedIn owns the business market, Twitter has a signaling for the crowd, Tumblr got bought by Yahoo, who knows what's going to happen there. Yahoo's trying to make some moves. You got Microsoft trying to be relevant uh, with Bing. And what you're seeing, in my opinion, is an explosion of social networks. So to me, the metaphor that I'm seeing right now from the, my experience is the web created a few web pages, then it became a million web pages, then it became zillion web pages, search engine built on top of it. What you're seeing now is, a, is the construction of a lot of niche social networks, relationships, and big data is starting to surface that. So what I believe is, is that you're going to see a new search engine emerge that's going to sit on top of all these social networks. So that is why I think there's a cold war going on because they're all jockeying out. In essence, Facebook competes with LinkedIn, LinkedIn competes with Twitter, Twitter competes with LinkedIn and Facebook, so there's a cold war between those big three. And I think you know, the hashtag is what we talk about, Dave, will liberate them all, and that's what CrowdChat's all about. So and I'm excited by CrowdChat.net. So, so Facebook has twice the value of, of HP, more than twice the value of HP right now. It's insane. <laughs> if, you were a, if you were a portfolio manager, where would you put your money, HP or Facebook? I think HP is a good buy right now. I think Meg is going to turn this around. I think, you know, uh, as all the critical criticisms we've had of her in the past and, and, you know, the questions, we've also had praise for her and I think, you know, I'd give her you know, props. I think she's very conservative. She's going to really pick her marks. 
You know, it's like when I used to be a, a, a double black diamond skier, you, you know, those deep and deeps, you pick your spots to make your turns, and if you screw up, you're dead. That's, I think, the, 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 the mode she's in right now. The company is such a fragile state when she took over, Dave, as we talk about all the time. She's looking down that slope, and she's saying, I got to pick my turns, and that's what she's doing, and she's being very, very careful, minimizing her public appearances, being specific with her speech writing, and so it's very clear that she's taking a very conservative approach. So, so if you look at HP's assets, it's just overall good, good, good company. And if you look at the value of HP, you know, I question the Facebook value relative to that, but that's just me. And, and just uh, another data point is LinkedIn and Twitter, Twitter's actually more valuable now than LinkedIn by about a billion dollars. Twitter's worth 28 billion, LinkedIn's worth 27 billion. So it didn't take long for Twitter yeah, I mean, as a public company to surpass the value of LinkedIn. I've always said that these social networks are like nightclubs. You know, after a while, the Yogi Berra quote comes into play. So I don't go there anymore because it's too crowded. But you mentioned you know? you're high on, on CrowdSpot. So CrowdSpot's, or crowd, CrowdChat is betting the, 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 on Twitter, right? I mean, Well, we love Twitter. I think Twitter is a signaling uh, social network around active, mobile users, people on the go, breaking news. I think the consumption model on Twitter is very much going to look like people who are, are passively consuming Twitter. I think there's a build content and consume content model. Does, I think does, Twitter is a, is a lower percentage of building, but those active builders are providing a significantly positive user experience. You, and the consumers are like the 80% or 70% are consuming the content that the 30 to 20% are building. So that's the relationship with Twitter. And you know what? That's social dynamics. I don't do, think that's an, an anomaly. Do, do, tw do tweet or do chat platforms like CrowdChat need to expand beyond Twitter, in your opinion? Yes, absolutely. We have it for LinkedIn and we'll have it for Facebook. And we met with Facebook. We haven't met with Twitter yet, but we love those companies. I personally think they're awesome. And, and my, my feeling has always been, like to use the nightclub example, the user experience is everything, right? And to me, if you look at what, why we like CrowdChat so much, Dave, is that we are seeing significant data that pe people, average consumers, are tuning into hashtags as a way to dial up content. And I think that's a user experience dynamic that will force the Cold War players to essentially figure out something to do. And I think that's going to be our, our opportunity and opportunity for HP and others. So you're saying it's all about the hashtag. That's the sort of It's about the user That's the social currency. User experience. Talking about the virtual currency in Bitcoin, the social currency user is the hashtag. User experience. I love the MOOC trend, the multi-online communities with gaming, with education, now business. I think, I think the gaming culture that we see today from our, from our kids, Dave, will be the, be the model of collaboration for business and education in the future. Okay, so guys, thanks so much for this Bitcoin tutorial and riffing on the trends. This is SiliconANGLE's exclusive coverage of HP Discover, what's going on in Paris with the web, Gartner Data Center, we were covering that last night, we'll cover that again tonight. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We're here in, live in Barcelona, Spain. That's a quick news brief. We'll be right back with our next guest here at HP Discover after this short break.